G'day, it's Rodney from iComply and our final segment for reviewing the best of yarn on the farm, we're gonna talk about mental health and look back at the two phenomenal guys that I had on yarn of the farm this year to talk about mental health. Now, mental health is something that's rife in regional, regional areas and uh, COVID and the pressures of COVID, especially in the agricultural sector, um, have only accelerated that and it's been a topic that I've been really concerned about this year and something that I wanted to raise awareness for because of the simple fact that I saw a lot of my clients really suffering tremendous stress pressures and uh, how to deal with uh, you know mental health issues there's probably no one to turn to I turned to two really good guys uh, the first one Joey Williams uh, Joey's been a mate of mine for over 20 years and uh, former little halfback for the South Sydney Rabbitohs and professional boxer who uh, is now a very accomplished author, um, brought out a book called The Enemy Within. And uh, Joey spoke really candidly and raw about his struggles and also giving us some tips on what to look out for with regards to mental health. Um, it was probably one of my favorite podcasts to do this year because it was uh, something that I took a lot of information out of and uh, you know, these guys like Joey Williams and the next person I'm going to talk about, uh, Warren Davies, they, they're out there um, speaking about mental health, bringing it to the forefront and, you know, they, they do a lot of what we'd like to call free work. Um, they do a lot of work on the phone talking to people, helping them for nothing just because they want to make a difference and two very, very, very special people. The second person, Warren Davies, the unbreakable farmer. Well, what a story. Um, you know, Warren went through some really tough times uh, where he lost his dairy farm and uh, battled with men mental health and then something great happened. He, he seeked some help and he took his knowledge in, in farming and called himself the unbreakable farmer and went out and spoke to farmers about struggles with mental health and uh, Warren is an absolute champion that, you know, when I rang him um, and said, look, I've had a good chat with Joey. I want to have a chat with someone else that's you know been involved with farming. We just chatted on our podcast like we were two mates that we'd known each other for years. And uh, I think Warren's got a real skill in having that ability to resonate with farmers. And uh, I took a lot out of Warren's too. And two very powerful podcasts, which were just raw, unscripted, and just from the heart. And I want to thank both Joey Joey Williams and Warren Davies, the Unbreakable Farmer, for their time on having a yarn on the farm this year. And I uh, hope you enjoy the best bits of a very serious topic, um, and that is mental health. I worked on a farm for seven years and, and, and naively thought I knew everything I needed to know and then went into farm ownership or actually into a farm ownership situation in a family business with mum and dad. We bought the farm next door and it wasn't long into that business and, you know, not being, uh, being non-generational farmers, you know, there wasn't this big, you know, trial and error. We were still finding our feet and the first time, and, and obviously I went into business with mum and dad. Um, so anyone that's listening in a family business, you know, knows that this can be fraught with a bit of danger. I uh, went into business with the bank because the bank lent me the money. So I, I understood that, but I really didn't understand the power of my silent business partner and her name was Mother Nature. And she was the one that would come along and, and probably, Belt me around the ears a fair bit and and trigger she's, what I she's, now. She's the most influential silent partner because you know she calls all the shots. That's it, and I probably didn't pay enough respect to that, thinking that I knew everything. And that was and that and her intervening on a number of occasions in my farming business is what triggered what I now call my mental health journey. But there was three major events, and one first was a flood, um, which which was what triggered this. You know bit of a spiral but um, I didn't feel completely you know right there was something going on but I didn't understand what it was but the thing is is like most farmers the business comes first and yeah. you know we're just recovering from the flood so I had to get the business back on 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 you know back up and running you know recovering from the flood my number one focus was getting the business back up and not paying much um, attention to me 
And then so we recovered from that, we got going again. And then we had a, a couple of years down the track, we had a family breakup. Now, family for me is my number one value. So when everything started falling apart there, it was, you know, you know, just the spiral started getting bigger. You know, the arguing and always frustration and, you know, me wanting to do one thing, my mum and dad wanting to do another. It was just, you know, very confusing. And, and I started spiraling more and more out of control. Um, being a bloke, one, number one, and being a farmer, number two, my only way of dealing with that uh, was to solutions based. What's my solution? How am I going to get myself out of this situation? So that, um, in hindsight, I probably just should have walked away then, but took on a lot of debt at the same time. That's and the resilience coming out of you though, the the persistence to want to keep going. And, you, and you're right, business comes first because you know, as a business owner, every decision you make in your business can affect your family. So you're trying to think of how I can generate income to provide a good life for my family. So, you know, that's that's pretty much in a nutshell probably where your headspace was. Yeah, and that, and so my my thing was to buy them out of the farm, taking on a lot of debt, added a lot of stress, but I was really confident in my skills and my plan to be able to move forward. And that's what we did. And my wife and I, we sat down, worked out our 10 year plan and we started chasing it, you know, and making sure we were fairly driven to make sure we succeeded. And a lot of that come from my younger years when we lived in Melbourne, where the word <coughs> the word failure kind of followed me. And I didn't want to fail as a farmer because that was my chosen career. I want to talk about your book. And um, when you finished your career, you, you, you wrote your pretty much memoirs of your battle with mental health. And um, Defining the Enemy Within was the, the book that you bought out. And I, the reason why I want to talk about it is I, I want to tell you about and tell everyone about my experience with that book because I've known you've you written a book, you know, we're, we're mates on Facebook and, you know, we've known each other a long time and uh, I'd seen that your book had been launched and I, I was at Brisbane Airport the day after the launch and uh, lo and behold, there's The Enemy Within, my little mate Joey's book, sitting there in what the... Bad head. In My bad head yeah, you're like your mug, looking at the, uh, staring me in the eye. So as any mate does, you know, I go in, I buy the book. You want to support your mate. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, I, ha I had no, no interest in reading it because, you know, I don't get me wrong, I love to read. I, I'm more a, a John Grisham or a true crime. You know, the self-help section's never really been somewhere that I've gone to. But be as it may, I bought your book and I was on a, a flight to Adelaide. And I was going down to Adelaide, we were doing some work down there, um, labour hire work, and I was going down, I started reading your book, and it's a two hour flight from Brisbane to Adelaide. Joey, I got to Adelaide and I was probably 70% through your book. And I got off the plane and I had a little house in Adelaide, which was an hour away from the airport. Um, I walked straight off the plane and I sat in the, the waiting area, the departure down waiting area, because I had to finish the book. Now, your book affected me greatly for, for two reasons. And one reason was I couldn't believe how how brave you were to to put your, yourself out there and and tell everybody your story. But sitting there um, reading your book and reflecting after it. I actually felt like a real prick because you were writing about a time, as you said, you know, we were good mates and, you know, we were close. Um, you, you broke down in your marriage, you moved into my house and spent some time with me until you got on your feet. And, mate, you're talking suicide. You're talking deep and darkness. Now, I remember that time when you when you come and live with me, you know, I knew you were doing it tough. You know, I knew, Joe, you were doing it tough. You had a breakdown of your marriage, two beautiful kids that, you absolutely lived for. I remember how proud you were as a father um, when Brody played footy at Redfern. I must have got about 20 calls from you that week. Make sure you come down on Saturday, hey, Brody's playing. And I think we had the whole South Sydney NRL team down there that day to support Brody in his first game. But, mate, I had no idea what was going through your head. And it rattled me and it got me thinking that if I'm living under the same roof as you, and I don't know what's going through your head. I've got no doubt there's farmers out there 
that have got the same issues right now and their wife, their brother, their business partner, their kids, um, all those generational people that work around them have probably got, probably don't have the same idea. Over that period, was that a period where, I don't know, in, in dairy, um, pricing has really plummeted and, um, you know, driven a lot by supermarkets wanting to sell a dollar a litre milk. Uh, how was pricing around that time? Had that sort of stagnated or did that have put a little bit more pressure on you also? Yeah, like, well, it was probably a little bit before the dollar milk kind of thing, but we were getting 19 cents a litre for our milk. 19 and cents. It, and it was costing us probably, you know, 25 to produce it like yeah, it was you're going backwards and, in, and any and this is where farming is a really difficult industry because in any other business you just say no that's enough you can't do that anymore but as i explained my best mate's a hairdresser and i explained to him well everything that i do is always planned 12 months in advance or at least nine months because <clears throat> i've got to get my cows pregnant if i don't get them pregnant i don't get milk you know like yeah. so everything so it's not just something you can just go i'm stopping today yeah, I guess mental health, and especially with, with farmers, they're such a resilient bunch. And I think your story can resonate with a lot of farmers because back when you were playing rugby league and when you when you were boxing, mental health was was not really talked about. It wasn't um, talked about at all. Wasn't talked about at all, you know. And if you were, you know, if you had a few little mental problems, you know, the perception was, oh, he's a bit soft, that bloke. You know, he's he's a bit weak. He's you know, he's a bit weak and. Farmers have that same perception that, you know, if someone's doing it tough, a farmer will, he'll bottle it up inside because he doesn't want to be perceived as being weak, you know. Farmers are tough, they're, they're resilient, they're adversity fighters. And I think, you know, if anything, uh, what advice would you give to, to farmers that, that are facing or feeling um, this way? What are the telltale signs? and? And yeah, how can a husband or a wife or a brother or son identify them? There's so much in that, Rod. And and, and the thing is, right, is that whilst whilst I hid I, I hid it from the public eye very well, but behind the closed doors, my behaviours didn't show so as as much, right? So yeah, have a look at it. Like I always tell people, there isn't one singular format that can help people uncover what their partner, their husband, their wife, you know, their close friend might be going through. Um, what I what I tell people the most important thing is to just pay attention to our behaviours, right? And 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 anything that's the slightest ways that's different, that could be a trigger. You know, so what we need to do is just just have a look at whether or not our husband or our partner is snappy. Right now, now coming from a, an extremely tough time with with the drought, and then you know, f then straight into floods, and then you know, obviously with the with the downturn that we've got now throughout the world, um, you know, th there's a stack load of people that are impacted by this. Like the the mental health rates and the the challenges with our mental health on the back of what's happening throughout the world now, particularly in this country in the in the current climate that we're in now. It's going to far outweigh anyone that 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 the, the numbers. It's going to far outweigh the numbers that we're going to lose by the virus, by the numbers that we're going to use by the people that are impacted by suicide, and mental health in our communities, right? So, uh, as far as what advices there are, there is no one way to fix it. But I know, I know who I know the behaviours of my family under my, under my roof. Just like you would know the, the, the behaviours of your family, just like every husband, every wife, every mum, every dad, every 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 child, every every son, every daughter would know the impacts of their behaviours with their family. I always say, just look after your circle, right? And if we all look after our circle, then that can broader, you know, start to to, to reach out to the broader population. But let's just really pay attention to each other's behaviours and. Today's Are You OK Then, right? Now, the thing is with people with, with mental health challenges, they will get themselves up today, one day of the year, because 99% of the community is on the lookout for mental health behaviours and challenges today. Yeah. today, right? 
what we need to do is continue this conversation every day. Are you okay days tomorrow and the next day and the next day after that? But it isn't just about asking, are you okay? It's about having a look at behaviors and going, he's just told me he's okay, but I know he's not. You mentioned identifying the signs of stress. And I think one of the, one of the biggest issues is, and I've, I've been in situations where I've, I've seen farmers take their own life. And, you know, the biggest common denominator is their mates later turning around saying, geez, I wish I knew he was battling, or geez, I wish I knew he was doing tough, or geez, I wish I could have done something for him. Um, how do we, as, as mates, as wives, husbands, business partners, how do we identify those signs of stress and realise that, that someone is struggling? Because farmers tend to put up a wall, they'll, they'll cover it pretty good. Yeah. And, and I'll refer back to it because I had a listen to it. I've been lucky enough to share the stage with Joey as well. And I listened to, to his kind of answer to this same question that you, that, that you posed to him on Are You OK Day? And, and, it's a, and it's a question is how long's a piece of string? Like what are the signs? But there's some general signs. Are, obviously, the one of them, and I believe it's probably the biggest killer um, in Australia is isolation. Like, so if you know someone in your community that's generally involved in the community and, and, and how I share my story is that way, because like, um, the way I share my story, I talk about when I got angry and then, you know, when I, well, our business was failing, I started feeling shame and guilt because I was letting my family down. So then I started isolating myself from my community, from my family and my friends, because you know, I believed I was a failure. And, and so a lot of those signs are really subtle. And, and it, um, you know, as close friends or mates, you can pick up on those. Like, for instance, in a farm, like if you're in, a farmer kept their farm immaculate and all sprayed fence lines or, you know, mowed out the front of their front gate or whatever, and all of a sudden the grass is three foot long and you go, well, something's going on. He's either under the pump and he's really busy or he might be struggling. So. That's when you have to have the courage to have those conversations. If you notice, notice these real subtleties, like they, you know, if they're not turning up to an event in town that you know they've been there with bells on every other year, and then all of a sudden they don't turn up, or they're late, or you know they come and they they look a bit dishevelled, you know, they you know just chucked on any old shirt, and you know they might their shoulders might be down, or that you know just all these little subtle things you can pick up. Last week. I had a call from a mate of mine that uh, he rang me up and he's like, Rod, where are you? I said, I'm at the office. He goes, I've just had a conversation with a mutual mate. He said, I've just had a conversation with him and he's just flown off the handle because he's under the pump. He said, he's absolutely given it to me. You know, called me every name under the sun. And he was really upset by it. And I said, mate, look, don't worry, don't stress. I'll, I'll give him a buzz and I'll pull him in the line and I'll pull his head in. And my, my first mate said, no, no, I don't want you to do that. I want you to pop over his farm and see him because I'm worried about his mental health. I'm not worried about the fact that he called me every name under the sun. I'm actually worried about what's triggered that. And, you know, I thought that was really great. And I, I did, I got in the car, I went over and I said, mate, you're all right. And he said, oh, I'm under that pump, you know, like price of strawberries is in this shit and I can't get workers and yada, yada, yada. And, you know, like, but isn't it great that someone can say, I'm worried about his mental health, go check on him, rather than be worried about the fact that he just, he saw the tell sign. And that's exactly what, what you're saying. Look at the behavior. We'll make judgment. Yeah. Right? The first thing we do is make judgment <laughs> in that situation. I always say to people, don't look at what, look at why. Don't look at what happened, look at why it happened. Right, with behaviors. And again, behavior is language. Let's look at what language they're speaking. When they're not turning up to things, when they're not returning calls. You know, when they're flying off the hand like you. I know that that all sorts of anger, all sorts of you know disagreement around around different things and projecting stuff on on you know projecting our behaviours onto other people is just a sign for something else. You know, we never know what's going on. That's why I always say we just need to be kind. We just need to be kind and compassionate because we don't know what's going on behind the closed doors for some people. One of the things that I've learned because everyone talks about reaching out, right? You know, you've got to reach out for help. You've got to reach out and seek support. But, you know, it takes just as much courage to actually reach in. 100%. 100%.
and ask the question, you know, if you're really concerned about someone, a neighbour, a mate, a friend, someone in your community, a family member, it takes courage to, you know, open up that conversation. And, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, with the Are You OK Day thing, and like, I know I get involved in that as well, but one of the biggest things is if, you ask that question to anyone, if I asked it to you today or if we were standing in a room full of um, farmers, whether they're male or female, are you okay? The answer that you'll generally get back is, yeah, I'm all right. 100%, and I think, that's exactly. Because the walls are. I think this year's, convers- this year's promotion with are you okay day was, you know, uh, there's more to the conversation than there is. And, we're, and one of the things we've got to learn, and so, when we talk about mental health education, it's more about learning some skills about, you know, not to look what to look for, but, you know, obviously understanding science, but knowing the conversation to have and, you know, open-ended questions are our, our biggest defence, like what questions that aren't going to get, yep, no, nah, I'm okay, whatever, you know. I notice that, you know, I notice that you normally mow your, around your front gate, right? Yep. And now it's three foot long. What's going on? Well, he can't say yet no, mm. or uh, he's got to go. Well, the slash is broke. Oh, all right, that's fair. Do you need a hand to fix it? So you got to look at opportunities to have the conversation. So I'll come around and give you a hand to fix it. Why are you fixing it? Do you know, well, what's been going on? Rah, rah. And then all of a sudden, this conversation will evolve. And obviously, very delicate with what I say and how I say it, um, knowing that. Many people right across the globe are challenged by this stuff, and particularly in the farming industry, I get it. Um, you know, I, I'm conversing with with many farmers uh, all, all year round uh, around the different challenges that they go through mentally and emotionally. Um, but for me, that started that dialogue inside my head that told me I wasn't good enough, that I'd never amount to anything, and uh, started to talk to me. And and people would say, do you have like a diagnosed like schizophrenia or, or where you've got voices in your head. Well, no, that's not the case. What I have is an inner dialogue like everyone has. It's just that instead of me talking to me when I'm hungry and telling me that I need to have a feed or, or that I'm tired or when I wake up, I need to go to the toilet. Like my head is like a conti- like somebody sitting inside my head, continuously talking to me every single day, every moment of the day planning thoughts, plans and ideas to not be here anymore. One, when did you realise? And two, what steps did you take? Because I think a lot of growers, you know, need to understand that A, they have an issue and B, what steps they need to take. That's probably a good question probably to finish off because I'll I'll finish it off for you now because that'll lead into my three lessons. So. I understood that I was struggling, but I never did anything about it. So that underlying theme was business first, focus on that, don't worry about me, you know, that'll all get better. And it didn't, and it spiraled out of control until I was in a dark place, and a really dark place where I didn't think it was worth continuing. Yeah. So my turning point was when I found myself laying on the floor in my dairy, looking up at the ceiling, thinking, what the hell has just happened? And I call that moment in my life, my two feet of perspective. Mm-hmm. And I'll let you paint the picture of what happened there because you know, I don't want to become too graphic or anything like yeah. that. But right at that moment, life gave me two choices. But you, actually, I, you, you actually attempted to take your own life, putting it out there, yep. didn't you? Yeah. Yep. And <laughs> life gave me two choices at that moment. It was either I continued to be bitter and twisted and spiralling out of control or I could decide to get better. Now this happened before we lost the farm. Um, and as I said, the, my biggest battle is that loss of identity, I, even opposed to this, but I picked myself up off the ground that day and chose to become better. That journey has been a long one mm-hmm. and it hasn't been an easy one, but I made that I made that pact with myself that I would get better. And it's taken all its twists and turns and the ups and downs. and. Eventually, that's where I found myself now. I found my purpose and I found my passion again, and this is what I do. Joey, do you ever look back on your career and the battles that you've faced? And, you know, what'd you play? 50, 60 first grade games? 
played 50. 50, okay. A person of your ability and skill probably should have played a couple of hundred because, you know, I, I watched you single-handedly win games with just pure skill. And, you know, you were, you were 75 kilos ringing wet and you had 120 kilo blokes running at you, which, you know, you were brave, you were, you were skillful. Do you ever look back and think, I only wish that I had someone that I could have talked to and addressed these problems earlier, rather than suffering for the five or six or seven years that you did? Without a doubt, mate. You know what? Without a doubt, um, it, it would have been it would have been great to be able to. And the thing was, again, it was a challenge of the times, wasn't it? You know, like yeah, no, it one was. Spoke well, about no one spoke about no one knew about mental health. Back no one then. spoke no one about did. it then, right? Yeah. So, in, in the current climate now, someone's not going to look at you like you got four heads. No. Right, because it's it's a it's a the conversation's louder than it ever has been, right? So, did I wish that I could have spoke to about it with someone? I wish I had the tools to be able to cope with it, mm. right? And the thing is, it didn't. It wasn't until I went into boxing did I learn how to take those. To, do I learn how to develop those tools? And that tools, funnily enough, was about getting punched in the mouth. Yeah, because I, I, I wasn't a real tough guy physically. But you had this job. So, but I had, you had, well, had, I had to be. Yeah. I had to be because I was a small bloke. And then when you're in the boxing ring, there's nowhere to hide in there. But I think, you know, back in those days, you know, mental health, you're right, it wasn't spoken about. But I think now, if you actually admit it, you get more respect for it. Oh, because, mate. Because there's strength in vulnerability. There's strength in vulnerability. A hundred percent. Because if you, if you start to share your vulnerability, it gives other people strength as well. Right, so now conversation isn't about being weak. The, the conversation has been about how strong and brave that person is to do that, right? But I also get that it's one of the most challenging things to do it. I, I reckon I 100%. If, we could, if we could break down the barriers, and I guarantee you that, you know, when we talk about those two farmers that are neighbours that have a beer together at the end of the day, I guarantee you, and I don't want to state my reputation on it, that if one of them decided to drop his guard and say, mate, God, I'm doing it tough, you know? I guarantee you the other bloke would turn around and say, fair thinking, mate, me too. I'm a farmer, I'm doing it tough. I'm sitting on my tractor. I'm there spraying a crop that I've got no idea whether or not I'm gonna pick. And my mind's racing. What do you say to me? Brother, pick up the phone. You know, we've. We've we've all got we've all got um, you know uh, internet and so forth and you know our our, our phones are uh, I, I'm assuming most most uh, farmers are on, on the networks with their phones and stuff pick up the phone and ring Lifeline um, you know those type of things so and, and with that it's an anonymous call as well so there's no there's no judgment with that but um, mate talk to people talk to people write it down um, get it out of your head. You know, how we get it out of our head, a lot of the time is through things like being just being present. Remember I talked about being either in the, the, the future or the past? Yeah. We can't do anything about the past, only learn from it. And tomorrow might not even come, so we just have to live now. Live now, be mindful in the present moment, look for gratitude, look for edit exercise, and maybe pick up the phone and ring places like Lifeline on, on 131114. You know, it's, it's one of those things where you know, these, these crisis hotlines do a fantastic job in their 24 hour access um, that, um, you know, that, 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 that are always open to, to people. But I, I guarantee you one thing, the minute you start to, to, to reach out and start to get help for this stuff, the minute, I hon honestly promise you this, the minute you start to reach out and get help for this sort of stuff and show some vulnerability, the minute things start to get well. Well, there you have it, the best bits of a very serious topic in mental health. And once again, I wanna really thank Joey Williams and Warren Davies, two very special people doing some very special work out there in the mental health space. Um, guys, obviously mental health is, uh, always seems to raise its ugly head over Christmas. And uh, please look out for your mates. If anything I learned from both Joey and Warren is uh, look for the telltale signs, go over and check on your mates, make sure they're okay. and. One of the favorite things which Joey says is there's strength in vulnerability. Don't be afraid to talk about it. And uh, let's make sure that everyone's okay over the Christmas and New Year break. That includes you. Look, mental health, very important topic. Very lucky to have two guys share some great stories with us. I want to pay homage and thanks to Warren Davies and Joey Williams. Uh, 
Merry Christmas, guys, and have a happy new year. And if you like the podcast, please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you.